Mike McConville here for String Tech Workstations, Stratford, Ontario, Canada. So we have this Taylor guitar, Michaels, that you saw earlier. The neck has already been reset on this one, but I thought it'd be an interesting video to sort of bring you in the loop on Jody's Martin guitar as well that needs a neck reset. So both of these guitars have mechanically attached necks. So in this video, we'll do sort of a taste test comparison between the two different neck joints and how they're attached and what's involved in resetting them to the proper angle. So you've already seen that Taylor guitar. Let's zoom in on this Martin guitar and have a look. Well, it is definitely a horse of a different color the way the uh, Martin bolt-on neck works. So let's get these strings off and I'll bring you in. I wanted to bring you in first to show you that this little wooden plaque here is actually adhered with like a foam two-sided tape. So that needs to come off first. Well, since my hand is going to be in the way when I, when I do this, I've got to reach in that sound hole. I have a little probe that I made up many years ago. There's like a little rosewood handle. This will allow me to get in there and slip that off right on the tape line. So I did warm this up with the buffer and that'll allow this thing to just kind of sink right into the glue and we'll get that off nice and clean. Well, you're not going to be able to see very much because I'm kind of reaching in there, but I've just heated up that probe on that stationary buffer and that is warm enough to just kind of sink right into that foam tape and slice this off. I can see a space at the tip of the heel which tells me that that bolt is loosened off. That is what we've got. So we'll set that aside. I just want to see whether it's going to be necessary to, yeah, we need to squeak out a little bit more of that neck set angle so we will have to heat this up, slip that off, pull the neck off completely. So this is a different animal than the tailor. to keep in mind this is not wood this is some type of plastic material that they've switched over to so you don't heat this up as long as you uh, heat up wood this portion of the probe is buffed so it does not scratch the top it does not leave any marks I heated the actual fingerboard up for uh, about five minutes with this probe I'm holding I just heated it up on the buffing wheel and that's enough to kind of sink into the glue joint Okay, so that's holding that up and, ooh, wow, yeah, that's still pretty hot. Okay, so we should be able to continue. Those black marks you see are compound. They'll just rub right off. So the idea with the probe is it's hot. It's like too hot to touch with your hand, but not hot enough to scorch the, uh, the top. Yeah, so when I heat that up on the buffer, like when it comes off the buffer, it's pretty hot to the touch. Yeah, it's definitely more work, but uh, it needs to be done. Then we'll have 100% control on that neck angle. That's, that's still pretty hot from that five minute heating session. I'm gonna reheat that again, just right at that neck joint to So, we give that about four minutes, it's going to be plenty. Now, if this was rosewood, which it isn't, you would basically heat it up until you watch the resin bead or sweat out of the rosewood. But, of course, this isn't, this isn't even wood, let alone rosewood. Some type of plastic that you know, you've changed over to, and I guess there's a shortage of wood. And that bridge, I think, is the same deal. Yeah, that isn't wood. Look, it looks like ebony, but it's plastic. Okay, close enough. Take off our heat shield. This is an old ironing board, by the way. Oh, yeah. That's better. 
This one's getting kind of stubborn. Well, I don't normally need to bother doing this with uh, these bolt-on necks, but this one's getting real stubborn. Oh, and that does it. Boy, oh boy, that was a that was giving me a rough time. Well, as you can see, they definitely didn't make it as easy as the tailor neck. Yeah, they sure didn't make it easy. They got these two little nylon indexing uh, rods that I suppose keep the neck aligned. It's a good idea. I'll probably end up putting something in there myself. That's what sort of gives you grief when you go to take these things off because the probe, I had to cut through those uh, nylon tabs, uh, you know, in order to get this thing to release. You saw how easy that tailor neck came off. Okay, so I just wanted to show you all this marking here. I'm just going to wipe that right up. Okay, so, see all the smudging here? Just put a little dab of this. Is, this is actually congealed. It's a 3M final finish. You get it at any automotive store. I'll carry this stuff. There's a few different companies that make similar products. This is 3M's final finish. So, what I'm doing is I'm basically removing, they're not burn marks, they're compound marks from the, uh, each time I sharpen that probe, I put a little bit of compound on it. So that's what's, that's what you're looking at here, those black marks that will soon be gone. Voila! So now we're going to just very lightly sand, get rid of this glue, and then we're going to have to adjust that neck angle to kind of buy back that real estate for the action. Okay, here's a tip for all of you guys that are still sort of navigating your uh, GPS units. This Martin guitar that we're doing a neck reset on, there's lots of times where I like to flip it up like this and have access to the heel of the neck in order to sort of change that neck angle slightly. I'm going to back up for a bit because I want to show you what you need to do. When you put the Allen key on the underside of that platform, you see that screw rotating? Well, that acts as a positive stop. So when you slide that neck assembly forward, the, the male rail on the underside of the large U-channel, it butts up against that protruding threaded fastener. And it acts as a positive stop. So that's what allows you to actually do this and flip this vertically. Just want to take a second to explain that. Now I see why I was having such a struggle getting that off. You can see that, you can see there was a bit of uh, overflow here. We're going to clean that all off. And on this side as well, they kind of goop that glue in there. Anyway, we're going to start by cleaning all this up. So I like to come across the tip of the heel first, and I'm just going to take off just a slight little bit. So, so that's the deepest cut we're making. And as I come around to the other side, get a bit better look on this side. So that tape just gives us an idea of how much we're taking off. You can see it's not very much, but that little tiny bit will buy back that real estate that we need to kind of change that neck angle for optimum height at the saddle. So in anticipation of eventually doing a neck reset, which is only a matter of time, they have left a level of forgiveness here. So we got 609, that is the depth of this tenon. So let's go over to the mortise. So when we come over to the mortise, so that is 697. So what that means is they've left 90 thou of forgiveness. So when you tilt the neck back like that, 
this portion of the tenon is going to go deeper into the mortise. So they've anticipated that in this design. It's not quite as user friendly as the tailor neck, but it's certainly a lot easier than resetting an actual dovetail. So I'm going to clean up all this extra glue and we're going to do a dry run on this. I'm going to take that little bit off here and then we're going to go down to zero at this point and we're going to buy back all those years of string pull and we're going to tilt that neck back a little bit and that's going to give us control for the action. I've taken a second to record these numbers because we might lose those when we go clean up that glue. I will retrace those onto the top. I'm just being a little fussy here, make it easier for the next guy. Whenever that is, I'll probably be long gone by then. Okay, we're going to bring you in here, and I am going to clean up that top. Now, this is one of those short scrub blocks that you guys have in your fretting kits. This is a good example of where I use the shortest scrub block. Very quickly, cleans up that glue residue, and levels off those nylon indexing pins to give us a hundred percent contact. And it's really, you, you know, kind of, for the record, more than anything else. So I've got this disc, sanding disc, on my die grinder, and I... <laughs> And I'm going to actually slow that down. That's about right there. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm starting this with the die grinder. So this tip, this is where I take the most off on this end at the tip. And then that goes down to zero. I take nothing off on this end. So we're going to start with the die grinder. checking it against the tape. I am going to chase it up a little bit with the die grinder, but I'm really going to do this by hand. So I'll just carry on. It does not take very much to tilt that neck. This is why I turn the die grinder down. I don't want infinite torque on this thing. So I've got this portion here right down to the tape. Now we'll switch over to sanding sticks. Most of you have seen that video I made on making these little sanding sticks out of tongue depressors. And this is a perfect example of where I use this. So I'm starting here. And I like the fact that there's a bit of flex in that tongue depressor. And it allows me to favor the inside closest to the tenon. It's okay to have a little tiny bit of a hollow around where the tenon meets the actual heel. I've just freshened up that tongue depressor with some, uh, some fresh sandpaper. The availability and affordability of the tongue depressors is obvious. But that's not the only reason I use them. When you're sanding, I can actually put a little bit of a helixical twist on that tongue depressor to make sure that I stay away from that outside edge. You've got to watch it. That outside edge is the one you're going to see when the job is done. So taking that die grinder again, I want to take a little bit more off here. <laughs> Increase that torque a little bit more. Now the fact that that's round, it naturally sort of creates a little bit of a hollow to the inside. And that's what I want. So from here to here, it's beautiful. Now we're just going to work our way up 
to about the middle of the heel on both sides. Try and avoid that outside edge as much as I can until I get right to the very end. No shortcuts here. You've got to kind of go back and forth until you get a nice fit against the uh, against the guitar side all the way along from the tip right up to the underside of the fingerboard. And we're going to check that neck angle as we're at it too so you can sort of see the progress as we move along. Let's go to the guitar. For this next step, I'm going to put that fastener back in. I've got my little stubby Phillips screwdriver. Screwing it in until I make contact, and then I'm going to back it off a little bit. So I'm going to reach in with that screwdriver, and I'm going to loosen that off. So what I want you to pay attention to is this seam i reach in there and grab that fastener. Now I have snugged that right down, but that, we're not ready to do that yet. So this actual seam here, watch that lift when I release. See this space here? Well that's where I use the die grinder to kind of take off the most of the material at the tip and, and about an inch up from the tip. So the rest of this edge needs to be gradually blended from where we use the die grinder right up to the underside of the fingerboard. So I'm loosening that fastener off on the inside so that I can flex this and slip a piece of sandpaper in there. Okay, that's what we want. I'm pushing this right up to the fingerboard. So what I'm doing is I'm sticking my sandpaper in here. So the trick here is when you're done, you want to make sure that you've got the same amount of strokes on one side of the heel and the other side. So you got four strips of sandpaper and just kind of working that a little bit at a time. So you can see why it's to your advantage to have a little bit of a hollow on the inside to make sure that outside edge comes down tight. I've cut this down even thinner and that allows me to work on the inside where you can't really see and bring that down in order to uh, persuade that outside edge to come in tight. So the thinner strip allows me to go the, to the inside edge and stay away from the outside edge so that we can bring that outside edge down tight. Pull that through. I'm liking that. It's definitely looking better. So you only want to work one side of the heel so much because you're actually changing the angle at which the neck joins the body. You want to kind of check as you go. You don't want to take more off one side than the other. So I am going to start to work on that other, on the opposite side of the heel. I'll flip this over in a second and show you all the various neck to body angles that we had to check uh, before we did our final finessing here. So this is the treble side of the heel to side junction and that is the base side. So I'm happy with that, good fit. Okay we're doing another neck reset on another Martin guitar. I just want to explain what I'm doing, how I'm doing it, and why I'm doing it the way I'm doing it for your benefit and for anyone that has to do a reset at any time in the future on one of these Martin guitars. So at the 18th fret I've got two drilled holes and then I take the corresponding drill bit, flip it 180 and push it in as indexing pins on either side. The reason for that is when we go to re-glue the fingerboard extension the neck angle is perfect. I've done the reset. This is dry run and this is why I'm taking in right now to explain exactly what I'm doing and why I'm doing it like this. So these two pins here actually prevent the neck from swaying this way during the reinstallation. Here there are two larger holes. These two holes are drilled so that the next guy, whenever that is, it could be 
30 years down the road or whenever, those are pilot holes for the steaming needle. When it comes time for a neck reset next time, this is going to be like Christmas for the guy doing the neck reset because when he pulls that fret out he'll see that it's all ready to go. In fact, that's probably not a bad idea for Martin to incorporate in their design. And incidentally, this needle is, uh, I bought a couple of these years ago, I put it on my uh, cappuccino maker, it allows me to sort of get in there and steam. This was Brown's Guitar Factory, John Brown. I'm hoping he's still in business and business is thriving, but anyway, that's where I got it. So like I said, when it comes time for a neck reset next time, this is like paint by numbers for whoever's got to do that. So I just got off the phone with the Martin Tech Support fella and I asked him one question, one question only. These fingerboards that are some type of composite plastic, um, I asked him, can I just use regular wood glue for that? And he said, yeah, no problem, that's how they're designed. So that question is answered. So I will just spread wood glue on the underside of that fingerboard extension. I have a, I have a, call, a wooden call that I'll use to sort of clamp that down. And then for the actual, for the tenon and mortise, I'll mix up some... I'll mix up some hot hide glue and we'll bring you in for a close play-by-play, step-by-step. So I wanted to demonstrate just how much sway there is. See how that fingerboard moves back and forth? I've slipped these indexing pins up to allow that to sort of move freely and you can see why we have those indexing pins during the gluing process. So as an historical courtesy, I've copied those original numbers that were kind of lightly sanded off when we cleaned this up for the re-glue board. So whenever, wherever this neck comes off again, for the record, we've got all the numbers right. I pointed out earlier in the video, these nylon rods, I did end up having to slice right through those. And the purpose of those nylon rods is the same purpose as these indexing pins. And that is to stop the neck from swaying side to side as you get into the gluing process. So I've got this this cute little uh, Lee Valley double boiler set which is awesome because a little tiny glue pot. So I've got those hide glue crystals and we're just going to add a little bit of water to that. We'll give that a stir in a second when it heats up. And this is the double boiler jacket for this hide glue pot. So this is like pewter so it's quite heavy. So that just goes on the hot plate in the saucepan full of water. So we'll have that hide glue heated up in a second. By the way, this, this uh, hot plate I got from Canadian Tire, I think it was $13 or something, might be 15 bucks. The one I got from Lee Valley that came with this thing was junk. Sorry, Lee Valley, I know you're known for quality, but in this case, you failed miserably. We're just letting that heat up and we'll glue that Martin neck back on.
there are six different planes that need to be considered and that you have to check before you glue that neck into place. It has to be right this way and this way. It's got to be right this way and this way. And what we did was we set the neck back. And it also has to be right this way and this way. So we're going to check first along the string path going from we're going from the six string to the six string bridge pin hole and we're checking along the edge of the neck to make sure that when we fret it doesn't go off the edge so that's beautifully centered so now we go over to the first string so we check the first string slot in the nut and then the corresponding bridge pin hole and again that comes along nicely uh, we're well away from the beveled ends of the frets no issues there so the next thing that needs to be understood is so now where it meets the body there's going to be a high spot when I put that straight edge there you can see how much it's rocking we work specifically on the highest spot with a very short block and it's not a big wide block it's narrower than the fingerboard and I'll set the timer just so you can see how quickly we take care of this okay let's get started We start with a little mini scrub block on the highest part. Go to our next longer block, still concentrating on that hump. To our next length of block. By getting rid of this high spot we're basically blending this whole thing right to the last fret. Okay, let's stop for a second and check. How much difference did that make? Uh, <laughs> quite a bit. We're right up to here now. So still concentrating on the top and right to the end of the fingerboard, taking out that high spot. Again. This is still pretty exaggerated. So I'm going back to the shorter block for another run check that again oh yeah we're getting there now there's a little bit of fall off on the top end and that's that's not too bad it's much improved from what it was still going to our medium length small block okay now we're going to step it up to the longer run again and now we're going to spread it out a little bit further towards the tenth fret and up Okay, I'm, I'm liking that. So I'm going to put a couple of frets in and I'm going to check this. Three minutes. So when I lay that straight edge along the crowns of these frets, well, we've made tons of progress in that three-minute sanding session. I'd still like to work this area just a hint more, and then we'll be ready to reinstall the frets. I'm going to work this upper area right here.
I do an eight count of sanding strokes, like one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight. Wow, that's great. Okay, so we've arrived. So something I want to explain here. These sanding blocks have a slip of leather and I get the local Amish to sort of cut the leather to the right thickness so that there's just enough flexibility to follow the curvature of the fingerboard. And you want it to be narrower because as I sand, I'm thinking of the trajectory of the string path. I'm sanding along the string path. So what we end up with, we get a perfect radius match and I'm going to bring you in in a second to show you. I'm going to get a tracing off this fret and we're going to check just how accurate we are here. Okay, this is the tracing that I took off the fingerboard. Let's see how accurate we are. How's that for accuracy? I never made any conscious effort to try and copy the radius. That flex in the leather block, and this is a jointed quarter sawn block, dead flat. The flex in the leather naturally followed that exact radius. So without even trying, we've got a perfect radius match. So what you're looking at here is the frets in the order that they came out. Now this is one place where I do use a black magic marker to mark the base side of the fret. Black for base. All these frets are going in exactly where they came out. So the only little bit of cheating I do is I buff those ends before I put them back in just so that we don't have to do an edge dress. That's it. It's a beautiful thing. I did not show this in the video. I'm just going to mention it to you now. When you take that much material off at the neck to body junction, you need to deepen those fret slots to receive the tang. Obviously it's shallower than what it was to begin with. Five strokes basically. One, two, three, four, five. This definitely takes all of the guesswork out you get. Okay, here's another Martin guitar tip. So the truss rod adjustment is way in there. Your regular Allen key is not going to work. I take a T-handled Allen key, cut off half, shove it into the sound hole, back it up, and that gives you enough length to reach right in. And the other bonus is you actually have quite a bit of leverage now because you've got a handle. The neck is dead straight, so I want to actually encourage a little bit of relief in that neck, so I'm going to back it off just slightly. And we're going to throw some strings on this thing and really check. But just before we do that, I'm going to melt some hot wax, black wax, and we're going to cover up those steaming holes that we put in under the 15th fret to get access to the mortise. So kind of cover that in. And then however many years from now, when it comes time to reset the neck again, that's going to be many years from now for sure. It'll be paint by numbers for the next guy. All the footwork's been done for him. So just take some steel wool and, and that basically conceals the small little steamer holes that I put in underneath that fret. There we go. Once again, we cover our tracks. Nobody would ever know that this neck was ever reset. It's right back to factory spec. So you can take a look at that action now. This thing is buttery smooth. And there are a few little light zingers here. And I'm going to hit those very light fret dress. It starts on the third. Just a couple of notes on the third and on the second. And then the first string's a little zingy there. We're going to take that down. And we're going to walk you through that as well. So light fret dress. And this thing is definitely on the home stretch. It's not that unusual to get a little bit of zinging at that transitional section where we've leveled out that hump. Not an issue. We're just going to do a very light fret dress. Recrown and polish full length and we'll be done. So these are the files that you get in your, in your kit that I sent out and you can see that there is not a lot of resistance to this file. We got it pretty good there when we leveled it out. Just a little tiny bit of a hint of resistance and that's it. So you can see that I'm moving the file. I always keep it in line with the strings but I move obliquely. Now the reason I do that, if you just file straight like that, you're gonna cut a swath the same footprint as the file. 
when you move across the radius obliquely like that, you're really just leveling along the string path. And you can hear it. There's almost no resistance at all. We got it pretty good when we leveled that fingerboard. But I do want to bring you in for the recrown here and just show you these are the two frets that got the biggest hit. So the real trouble spot was right here. And again, I don't touch the center of the crown with that file. Just taking those sharp edges off. We're going to finish that with a scrub block I put in your kit. Okay. And that's looking really good. I'm happy with that. I've got that fret guard in place, of course, to protect the top as I'm doing this work. I'm very happy with that. Looking really good. We're, we're going to switch over to our scrub block now, and I'll give you a little bit of a different perspective. So this is after our pass of 320 grit. That got rid of all the file marks. And we did go full end to end and got rid of that string wear in the first five frets or so. So that's our 320. And now we'll step it up to 400 grit. I stack all these grits on the scrub block so they're all ready to go. Here's another 400. I kind of slip it along the block so I get maximum use out of the sandpaper. Now I've got two pieces of 600 grit. This is going to give us our finesse just before we buff. And then our last piece of 600. All of the string wear is gone. Well, believe it or not, this actually started out as a three inch disc. There isn't much left on this, but I, I'll get another three or four fret dresses out of this and I'll change the wheel. reduce the torque on that for when we were uh, skimming off that heel for the neck reset. There we go. Okay, it's still not infinite torque. Like if I, if I push down, it stops. But I, I just got a little more torque than that. So that is the finished product. And now we're ready to string it up and check it again. There's our finished neck reset at the heel to side junction on the treble side. And that's a look at the base side. And there's the heel cap.